All right, my friends. We've only got 20 minutes for this part, so let's just jump right in. And we're going to talk about something that maybe you've never heard of before. Maybe you know a lot about it. I don't know where you are, what you're at, what you're thinking. But it's something that we all have within us already, uh, a hidden refuge that we are able to go to 24-7, no matter where we're at or who we're with or what's going on. Uh, and it is called the interior life, okay? Maybe that's something you've never heard before. I don't know. Uh, but we're going to start with St. Paul, and he's talking in Corinthians where he says this. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? You are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. You've probably all heard this before, right? This is not new information. Your body is a temple. Usually you probably hear it in the context of like eat more kale and fewer Twinkies, right? Like not supposed to be a temple to the goddess little Debbie. Okay, but your body is important, right? You should take care of it, absolutely. But your body and your soul are one. And so your soul also is a temple, is a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit, okay? Who is God, just as much as the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit who wants to live within you. When you were born and you were just a little baby and all you did was cry and scream and wiggle and poop and everybody said how cute you were, probably. Okay, you were born as a beloved creature of God. You were made in his image and likeness. And that's amazing, right? And of all the cool stuff that God made, which is mountains, oceans, sunsets, blue whales, bung dung beetles, right? All the cool stuff that God has made is amazing, but none of it is as good as you. Because you, the human person, are the only thing in all of creation that God created in his own image and likeness. You have a heart like his. You have the ability, the capacity to be in a relationship with God. That's an amazing thing. But as cool as that is, it's not the coolest thing that God did. When you were born, yes, you were created beloved, right? But when you were baptized, which for most of us was when we were just little babies, here I am, crying and wiggling before the water hits, okay? When you were baptized, something amazing happens. You were transformed. You were no longer a beloved creature of God, but you became a beloved child of God. In that moment, through the sacrament of baptism, the Holy Spirit came to live in your heart and God changed you, transformed you into his son, into his daughter. We talked about that this morning in our men's and our women's sessions, right? That moment when God looks at us and he calls us beloved. And your capacity to be in a relationship with God changed into an actual relationship with God. Because in the sacrament of baptism, a couple things happen. First of all, God gets rid of your original sin. Second, he initiates you into his body, his family, the church. You become a member of it, right? Uh, another thing that can happen is that you get access to all the graces that come from all of the sacraments that are in the church. The catechism says that the baptism is the basis of the Christian life, that it is the beginning of life in the spirit. In canon law, okay, specifically, uh, canon law 535.1, if church law is your thing that you like to nerd out on on the weekends, it says that one of the duties of the pastor of a parish is to oversee all the baptismal records. Everybody who gets baptized, we have to make sure that those records are, and I quote, accurately inscribed and carefully preserved, okay? Which might just sound like administrative red tape, but actually shows how much care the church has for the moment of your baptism, for the moment that your salvation was assured, a record of the exact moment that the Lord claimed you for his own and made you his beloved child. There is no other Christian faith that takes such care with our baptisms, nobody. And let me pause for a second here and say what some of you might be thinking. Well, wait, Rachel, um, I've never been baptized. So does that mean that I, I can't have a relationship with God? Absolutely not. No. Um, God can have a relationship with you. He does. I know he does because you're here. You wouldn't be here without him. None of us would. And baptism is not the only way that God can move in our lives, right? It's evident as we look at the scriptures that the Holy Spirit was working in the lives of the disciples way before they caught the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, okay? There's no limit to how God can come into our lives. He uses the sacraments as the ordinary channel of his grace, but he's God, right? He's not limited to what he creates and he can and does have a relationship with you. 
And so if you have that relationship with God, if you are baptized in another faith, uh, or if you are not baptized at all, if you want to come into what we call full communion with the Catholic Church, I want to assure you that we can help you with that, okay? Uh, that we can do that. If you want the Holy Spirit to literally take up residence in your soul, pursue the sacraments. I am sure that your group leader, that your parish priest, that any of the priests here would be happy to connect you with the next steps that you would need to do that. There's a wonderful story in Acts chapter 8. Uh, the disciple Philip, he's on the road, he's on his way, and he hears the Holy Spirit tell him to hop into the chariot that's passing by and start telling the guy inside about Jesus, okay? And the guy inside, through the promptings of the Holy Spirit, is actually already reading the scriptures from the prophet Isaiah. Scriptures from the prophet Isaiah that point to Jesus, but he never heard of Jesus before. So Philip hops into the chariot and he goes, let me tell you about Jesus. And this guy is so moved by Philip's instruction, his teaching on Jesus, that he sees some water on the side of the road. And it doesn't say in the scripture if it's a river or a puddle, it doesn't matter. He just sees some water on the side of the road and he looks at Philip and he says, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And the answer is nothing. So Philip takes that water and he baptizes him right then and right there. Now, I am not proposing that if you have not yet received the sacrament of baptism, that we just crack open a limoncello LaCroix and get it done. Okay, that's not, that's not how it works. Uh, but there is nothing to prevent you from receiving the sacraments if that is something that you desire. Baptism, Eucharist, confirmation, your priests and your leaders would be thrilled to help you encounter those sacraments. If you desire it, there is nothing to prevent you. You've got a soul, we all do, and that soul needs care. Because in the depths of our beings, we've all known what it means to feel afraid, frustrated, anxious, right? We all know what it means to feel overjoyed or peaceful or calm. Being human is feeling things, and it's a wide breadth of things. Sometimes things that are beyond our understanding. Those are things that we can experience because of our human soul, our unique eternal soul. And no matter what is happening in our world, in our families, in our circle of friends, or online, we can all retreat to that refuge of our own interior life. So what is the interior life? Okay, the simplest definition of it is our life with God, our relationship with him. Remember, we were created with that capacity to be in relationship with God. And through our baptism, we have an actual relationship with God. It's not something you need, it's something you already have. Like Father said this morning in his homily, faith is not something that can be lost or taken away. Once you have the gift of faith, you have it. It's just up to you whether you replace it, whether you neglect it, or whether you nurture it. And if you choose to nurture your interior life, I promise that your relationships will all get better, right? It's like any other relationship in our life. If you're dating somebody, you're friends with somebody, you work with somebody, you're married to somebody, and you don't talk to them, <laughs> you don't listen when they talk, you don't share your life with them, you're not going to have a very good relationship. Good relationships are about communication. Absolutely. Sometimes they're about sacrifice. Some things they're about giving up what you want, what you need, what you think you have to have for their good. But having quality relationships in our lives makes our whole life better. The same thing is true in our relationship with God. I was baptized when I was just a little baby. Uh, I went to Catholic school for my whole education. I received all my sacraments right on time. And I went to mass every single Sunday because my mom said we had to. And if you would have asked me, Rachel, you know, who is Jesus to you? If I had the words to say it, I would have probably described it a lot like George Washington, right? He's a, well, he's a historical figure. He really lived, I know that's true. Um, but he's not somebody that I can have an actual relationship with because He's dead, right? Uh, and in fact, I probably would have more accurately described it like Santa Claus. Like I believe he, he is there and he's always watching and I need to be on my best behavior so that when I ask him for stuff, he will give it to me, right? Not a really a great way to relate to the Lord. And when I was 14, at the very end of my eighth grade year, I had the opportunity to go on a weekend long retreat at another parish. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I did not want to go. I had been on a one day retreat for my confirmation the year before, and I thought that was frankly stupid and boring enough for one day. But I had two really good friends who insisted, they just wouldn't stop nagging me. They were like, you gotta come, you gotta come. And finally I decided, you know what, a weekend with them bored at this church thing is probably better than a weekend at home bored alone, right? So I went. Uh, and it was fine. <laughs> it wasn't like life-changing. There were some talks, there were some games, there were some snacks, that was nice. Uh, but nothing really crazy until we got to the Saturday night. 
They take us down into the church. They sit us all on one side of the church. And the youth minister guy gets up. He talks for a really long time. And I don't remember everything that he said. But one thing really stood out to me because I had never heard it before. He was talking about Good Friday. He was talking about when Jesus was on the cross. And here's what he said. When Jesus was on the cross, your face flashed across his mind. I'd been Catholic my whole life and I had never heard that before. When Jesus was on the cross, your face flashed across his mind. So then he said, we're gonna have an activity. Don't be afraid. I promise nobody's gonna get hurt, which immediately made me go, why should I not be afraid that I'm not gonna get hurt? And they started taking kids away three or four at a time. I was in the very last group to go. And they walked me downstairs. They walked me through this activity. They walked me through the crucifixion as if I were Jesus, which sounds weird. Let me explain. Uh, I was blindfolded for this activity and I had a basket on my head, which was like my crown of thorns. And I carried a wooden two by four on my shoulders. That was my cross. Somebody really gently tapped a nail against my palms and against my feet while somebody else sounded a hammer in the background. And the whole time that I was going through this activity, I was just telling the story in my head. I knew that story. I've been hearing that story my whole life, right? And it's a really good story. There's a teenage virgin and she gets pregnant, but it's okay because it's God as a baby. And then he grows up and he's a carpenter. He works some miracles. He gets some followers. That's pretty cool. But then there's some people who don't like him. They plot to kill him. It's not good. He does die. It's brutal. But don't worry because three days later he comes back because he's God. Remember? <laughs> really cool story. Lots of interesting characters, crazy plot twists, but to me, just a story. So the activity ends, they take me back up into the church. I'm sitting in a pew by myself, I'm still blindfolded. I'm thinking about the activity that I had just walked through. And I'm thinking about what that youth minister had said that when Jesus was on the cross, my face flashed across his mind. And then the music I played a song that I had never heard before with lyrics I will never forget. It starts off by saying, thorns on his head, a spear in his side. Still it was a heartache that made him cry. He gave his life so you could understand, is there any way you could say no to this man? To this day, I still do not have the words to describe to you what happened to me in that moment, but I just knew. I just knew in a way I had never known anything before, in a way that I've known very few things since, that this Jesus stuff is real. It's real that he's a real person who really lived and really died and really died in a horrible, horrible way. A thousand times worse than any movie version we've seen, right? 10,000 times worse than the activity that I had just walked through, that he really went through it. And while he was going through it, he was thinking of me. And he was thinking of you. Your face flashed across his mind. He was thinking of you in that moment and he's been thinking of you ever since then. If Jesus forgot about you for a second, you would cease to exist. And that moment changed things for me. Now it didn't change everything for me, okay? I didn't walk out of that church, you know, crying tears of holy water and only speaking a Gregorian chant, okay? That's not real, that didn't happen. But what did happen is that I made a decision. I decided that if Jesus was for real, and I now knew that he was, that if Jesus was for real, then my life was gonna have to look different. That if he had died for me, then I was gonna have to live for him. So I started doing what our church calls uh, cooperating with grace, which just means doing the stuff you're supposed to do to become the person you're supposed to be. Stuff that like priests and religion teachers and people like me love talking about, okay? So I started praying on my own. That was different. I liked that. I <laughs> started going to confession more regularly. Started uh, paying attention at mass on Sunday. Don't know if you ever tried that. It's kind of weird. Uh, I started hanging out with people who were pretty legit, friends I'd made at youth group. I started learning more about what the church teaches and why. I started basically working on my interior life. And I say working on it because it's a job. It's something that's in progress. It is something that I'm still working on today that's key because none of us has it figured out. Not me, not anyone else you've seen on this stage, not your group leader, not your priest. Sorry to out them to you, but we don't have it all figured out. If we did, we would not be here. We would be face to face with our maker, with our halos and our harps, okay? We're all working on it. Sometimes we get it right. Sometimes we get it wrong. We ask forgiveness and then we try again, right? The interior life is a process. It's a skill that you can practice just like anything else. You wanna be good at sports? 
You wanna get good grades? You wanna master some kind of artistic endeavor? You've got to practice, right? Well, the same thing is true for us. We try and try and try again um, so that we can get a relationship with him to be the best it will be. The entire story of the Bible from beginning to end is the story of God revealing himself to his people. It starts with the prophets who prophesy the Messiah. And then we get to know God in a new way through Jesus who gives us access to him tells us more about the Father and who he really is. And then before Jesus is gone, he establishes the church as a clear way for us to continue to get to know God, a place where we can experience those channels of grace that I was talking about a second ago. And I know that it can be easy to get frustrated or confused when we sit down to pray or we crack open the scripture or we're in adoration and it seems like everybody else is getting struck by lightning, right? The heavens are opening. They're having a very emotional moment, okay? And let me just say two things about that. Number one, I don't know what's happening to them in that moment because it's not my business. It's not. It's their interior life, not mine. That's between them and God. And two, I think sometimes it can be easy for us to feel like God isn't speaking to us because we're not listening because we don't know how. We've never done it before, right? We've never practiced it. Um, There's a great passage in 1 Kings about the prophet Elijah. There's a lot of people out killing prophets in those days, okay? They don't like what they have to say. They're trying to kill him. And honestly, Elijah, he's tired of being on the run from that. So he runs off into the desert where he lays down under a tree and begs God to put him out of his misery. He wants to die. And so he falls asleep under this tree. An angel shows up and brings him some food and some water, wakes him up. And you know what? After a snack and a nap, Elijah feels better. Okay, and so then he follows the messenger's instruction to go off to a cave. And there we hear, then the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Lord will pass by. There was a strong and violent wind rending the mountains and crushing rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, a light whispering sound. When he heard this, Elijah hid his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said to him, why are you here, Elijah? We expect the voice of the Lord to come like thunder. And there are certainly times where it does, but more often than not, it's a whisper. It's much humbler, much smaller, much more accessible because honestly, if we saw the face of God in all his glory, we would not survive it, okay? That's why Elijah covers his face with a cloak because he doesn't want his face to melt in the presence of the Lord, right? Instead, God comes to us humbler, smaller, more accessible, like a baby uh, from a backwater town called Nazareth who gets born into a cave in Bethlehem. Or in a piece of bread, a little small white ordinary host that we can take and receive, right? He comes into the heart of a 14-year-old girl who's sitting by herself in a pew on a weekend-long retreat. He comes in the scriptures and he comes in a whisper and he comes in the silence. If I could give you one piece of advice on how to best strengthen your interior life, it would be to seek out silence, okay? We are so surrounded by it. It's not gonna happen, silence. It's not gonna happen for you naturally. You're gonna have to seek it out because we live in a world that is so noisy. We're surrounded by it, right? Literal noise from TV and music and people around us or visual noise from screens, billboards, ads, posters on the wall, right? Internal noise from our own thoughts and concerns, worries and fears. We just can't escape it. But just because we are choosing to surround ourselves with this noise doesn't mean it's good for us. It's not, right? It's making our struggles with our mental health worse because we can't get any peace of mind. It's negatively impacting our physical health because it jacks with our sleep, right? And our spiritual health, forget it, right? If we can't take a moment to connect with the Lord, our spiritual life will struggle, um, And it feels like we can't escape it. Like we have to get ourselves way out into nature where there's no Wi-Fi or cell tower, just a cabin and a lake and Ron Swanson. And for some of you, that sounds like paradise, right? And for some of you, it sounds like the stuff of literal nightmares, okay? But silence is important. We need it. We really, really need it. Everything that I said 17 minutes ago about the amazing power of baptism to change your soul to have a literal relationship with God dwelling within you, that probably sounds like lunacy if you can't take five minutes of quiet to connect with God. 
But just because we're drowning him out does not mean he is not there. God is in all times, at all times, and he wants to spend all his time with you. We just need practice. C.S. Lewis, maybe you've heard of him, Narnia guy. He said this, when first things are put first, second things are not suppressed, but they're increased. So the translation into modern language means get your priorities straight, right? If you put God first, God who is the source of love, if you are plugged into him first, then everything else will get better. All your second things, your relationships, your schoolwork, everything that you pursue will get better because you're plugged into God first, okay? St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, uh, who was a Carmelite nun who was murdered in the Holocaust, said this, this inexhaustible source of power is the grace of God. It depends only on knowing one's way and going to this source again and again. Our way is the way of prayer, silence, sacraments, the main ways that God chooses to communicate his grace to us, readily available to help us. And I know how difficult it is. I'll say in this particular season of my life, silence is something that I really have to seek out, right? You think silence is hard as a 16-year-old? Let me introduce you to my six-year-old, okay? There are moments where it seems like the only quiet time I'm gonna get is being up with a baby in the middle of the night. And I'm not complaining, okay? God has made saints out of much harder circumstances than mine. See, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, who was murdered in the Holocaust, right? Like, I'm not complaining. I just have to get creative with what I've got. So in this season of my life, where daily mass is not happening, where devotionals are collecting dust on my bookshelf, right, where I can't find any quiet time when my little people are awake, I choose silence by having silence in my car instead of Spotify or a podcast. I make the sign of the cross when I go by a church to say hi to Jesus, who I know is in the tabernacle inside. I try to spend 10 minutes on the readings of the day to get a little scripture in first thing when I wake up to kind of equip me for the rest of the day, right? It's possible. We can do it. You've got time. Don't tell me you don't. One time we were at a youth night and we were asking the teens to get out their phones and check their screen times for an activity. And this kid pulls up his phone and says, oh yeah, yesterday uh, I was on my phone for 19 hours. 18 of them were on Netflix. I don't know if I'm horrified or impressed, okay? But, but I can tell you that if you check your screen time of the last week, you can probably find five minutes for the Lord, right? Netflix will still be there, I promise, okay? And we need to choose it for our own good, for our own interior life to help know the Lord better. The best Lent of my life, I'll end with this, is when I was a sophomore in college, I made one simple promise to God during Lent. I was gonna spend 40 minutes with him for 40 days. 40 minutes for 40 days. So somewhere between the time I woke up and the time I went to bed, I would just find 40 minutes for him. And maybe that sounds like a lot, but it's literally less than 3% of the day. So the other 97% of the day was mine to do with what I wanted, but I promised I would give him 40 minutes. And I didn't set myself up for failure. I will meet with you in the chapel every day at 7 a.m. till 7.40 a.m. And if I fail, I die, okay? No, I just said, let's be flexible about it. Some days it was daily mass. Some days it was a devotional. Some days it was walking around campus with praise and worship music in my headphones. It didn't matter how I met with him. It just mattered that I did. And during that Lent, my interior life exploded, okay? It just takes time. Time we all have, we just have to choose how to use it. So I'll end with this question before we get to some of your questions. Take a second right now, think about your life, your normal life, not at a Steubenville conference weekend, but when you get home this week, where is there a moment where you could carve out some silence? Where is there a place where you could meet with the Lord in some way? Rosary, holy hour, scripture, worship music, right? Where is there a place where you can be with him? Because he's already there, just waiting to be with you. Let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for being with us, meeting with us always. Lord, help us to be more attentive to your voice and all the ways that you're trying to tell us every day how much you love us. Lord, let us hear you. Let us respond. We love you and we trust you and we praise you. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.